morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on the line, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Allie Kane, and I will be the moderator for our presentation. I'm part of FLOOR's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, really our people, are at the core of our success. Today's webinar is titled The New Scale Small Modular Reactor, The Future of Energy is Here. So just a little introduction um, of the webinar. A variety of carbon free sources and technologies will be required to simultaneously satisfy consumer power demand and meet global net zero pledges. Today, nuclear energy provides more carbon free power than wind and solar combined in the US. Though renewable energy generation will increase dramatically during the next decade, nuclear power will still be needed to provide reliable cost effective grid stability. Small modular reactor or SMR technology is one of the best options to eliminate carbon emissions from conventional power generation plants while maintaining dispatchable power supply for a range of needs. During our presentation today, floor vice president Peter Nolmeyer will provide an overview of the SMR technology developed by new scale power, which is a floor majority owned company. Not only does the new scale reactor technology present clients with a safer, carbon free, modular, scalable, and economical solution to both on and off the grid power applications, the SMR design is also more resilient to natural disasters, cyber attacks, and grid disruption than traditional power plants. Currently, the new scale SMR is the only SMR design approved by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Fluor and NewScale recognize and thank the U.S. Department of Energy for their financial contribution and support for the development of the NewScale SMR technology. This material is based upon work supported by the Department of Energy under their cost share award number DE-NE0008928. Now let me introduce our feature speaker today, Peter Nolmeyer. Pete is currently assigned responsibility for marketing and commercialization of the new scale small modular reactor and ensuring its successful first of a kind deployment. Pete has 37 years of nuclear experience, including positions with the US Navy, BNW Nuclear Technologies, the US Department of Energy, and DynCorp. For the past 17 years, Pete has led challenging nuclear projects for FLUOR, and these assignments included serving as a deputy managing director and chief nuclear officer on the Magnox contract in the United Kingdom, where he oversaw nuclear power generation, defueling and decommissioning of the 27 nuclear reactors on the 12 Magnox sites. He's also served as vice president of strategic planning for the Savannah River Nuclear Solutions job site. He has served as a chief operating officer and executive vice president of Floor Hanford in Washington state. And he has served as a vice president on the K reactor decommissioning project. Prior to joining FLOR, Pete provided nuclear project leadership at the US Department of Energy, remediating former weapons production facilities at BW Nuclear Technologies, leading service work at commercial reactor sites, and in the nuclear, the United States Nuclear Submarine Force as a naval officer. Pete is a graduate of Cornell University with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and a certif certified naval nuclear engineer. In his spare time, you can find him fishing, golfing, or playing ice hockey. So Floor has a very uh, strong safety driven culture and it's our custom to start our meetings with a brief safety topic. So Pete, if you could please start with that safety topic and start sharing your presentation today. Thanks, Ellie. And welcome everyone to our Innovation Builders webinar on the new scale small modular reactor technology. As Ali said, I'll begin with a safety topic. And my safety message regards the greatly reduced emergency planning zone or EPZ for the new scale small modular reactor. So first, what is a small modular reactor? So we're all on the same page. Typically it's defined as a reactor generating between 10 to 300 megawatts of electricity, that's gross, and it must be modular, factory assembled, and able to be transported as a unit to the construction site. So today in nearly every nuclear power plant in the US, there's a 10 mile radius emergency planning zone that's designed to protect the public from potential plume exposure should there be an accidental release of radioactive contamination. There's also a 50 mile radius ingestion pathway EPZ, and that protects the public 
from releases uh, to the food chain from any accident scenario. And these EPZs are required and specified uh, by law. So New Scale's exceptional safety features, namely its small core size and defense in depth, have made a case for the, a reduced sized EPZ. And I'll talk more about those safety features in later slides. New Scale's seeking an EPZ that ends at the site security fence. This will be an EPZ of about a thousand feet in radius compared to the current standard of 10 miles in radius. And the new scale methodology to achieve this uh, remarkable improvement was submitted to the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission or NRC in a topical report in 2015. And that methodology has been accepted by the NRC. The NRC is also, uh, that, that doesn't mean, I'm sorry, that doesn't mean they're, they've accepted a certain dimension yet because that's very site specific and will need to be approved via the licensing application for each specific site. But they're backing uh, and showing their support for this reduced size EPZ with a new rulemaking, a new law that's being proposed. And that's currently uh, undergoing public uh, comment and rulemaking. The fence line EPZ was also proposed in an early site permit for the Clinch River site in Tennessee. And that permit application used a generic small modular reactor whose envelope and specifications were heavily influenced by the new scale SMR. That permit application and its proposed fence lined EPZ was approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. To give you an example of what this might look like, Here's the current emergency planning zone for the Seabrook nuclear power station in New Hampshire. The current EPZ for Seabrook is 10 miles in radius, uh, encompasses two different states, two counties, 23 different townships, and extends out over the Atlantic water, so also involves Coast Guard uh, response. There's circa 50 schools contained in this emergency planning zone. And Seabrook will have to perform about four drills per year involving these states, counties, and communities in their emergency planning efforts. This is a, a massive effort and it comes with a, a massive price tag. So what would it look like with a new scale SMR? You can see the little red dot that showed up. It would be a tiny little EPZ. So this is the potential EPZ blown up a little for the Seabrook nuclear power plant with a new scale SMR. Note the new scale SMR EPZ would only encompass the plant and would not even include any external facilities, including those businesses across the street. No schools would be inside the emergency planning zone. No part would extend over public waters, so no need to involve the Coast Guard. You wouldn't have to evacuate beaches or disturb the 170,000 people who are currently influenced or impacted by the current emergency planning zone at Seabrook. Elimination of all these emergency planning interfaces with the townships and states significantly reduces the new scale SMR operating cost. Early estimates indicate this could save a new scale plant operator about $7 million a year in operating costs compared to a large pressurized water reactor operator. This equates to $300 million reduction in plant operating cost over the 40 year nuclear regulatory commission license period. And if you translate that into the levelized cost of electricity, it's roughly a $3 per megawatt hour savings to the operator. The smaller EPZ also allows better ability to build this plant near a major industrial user or for district heating applications, or even to put this small modular reactor on a small plot size, uh, for example, for a, replacing a coal-fired plant. So why do we need small modular reactors? Today in the US, nuclear power uh, provides about 20% of the total power generation, but it's about 50% of the carbon-free energy supply. Globally, it's more like 54%, uh, I believe. So I or I'm sorry, just under 50%. So globally, renewable power surpassed generation from nuclear power in the last year or two. 
Increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases, as we've all read about, is a fact, and global warming and climate change, while disputed, uh, most people agree must be addressed urgently if we're going to prevent catastrophic results. So the challenge is how do we replace the 60% of the US electricity supply from fossil fuel plants? And globally, that number is more like 52%. Well, great strides are underway to increase wind and solar, and these must continue. However, several independent studies have shown that we cannot solve this crisis with wind and solar alone. Because as wind and solar penetration into the market increase, the cost to the consumer goes up rapidly due to the extra capacity, the extra storage, and the additional transmission costs from these highly distributed renewable sources. So too much wind and solar on the grid also causes grid instability and brownouts and blackouts will occur as demonstrated recently in California. Experts agree that increased storage will not be able to, to solve the intermittent nature of wind and solar, at least not in the near term. So dispatchable carbon free base load power is needed. And this demands the deployment of cost-effective nuclear power to operate in harmony with wind and solar power to provide the most reliable cost-effective grid. And this figure from a Bloomberg study, you can see that elimination of the carbon emissions from power generation only solves about 40% of the global carbon emissions problem. The challenge increases as we start to electrify the transportation sector and provide zero carbon process heat to other industries and develop cleaner transportation fuels like hydrogen and ammonia. So decarbonization of the transport sector alone, it's gonna add another 24.3 quadrillion BTU to the electricity generation challenge. Adding to this challenge is the growing number of countries and US states with significant carbon reduction goals. In this figure, you can see 37 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, and four U.S. territories already have renewable portfolio standards or goals in place as of April of 2021. And these renewable portfolio standards require a certain percentage of electricity be derived from renewable sources, many by a certain date, and the standards are uh, sometimes accompanied by stiff penalties. The transition to cleaner energy, retirement of coal stations, electricity, electrification of the transportation sector, it's forecasted to require more than 16,000 gigawatts of new carbon-free electrical generation by 2040. Bloomberg did a study, and in the red scenario of their study, they describe a pathway that's dominated by clean power, smaller, more modular nuclear reactors, deployed to complement wind, solar, and battery technology. And in this scenario, they also uh, propose hydrogen be manufactured uh, using nuclear power. So 1,286 gigawatts of new nuclear via small modular reactors is forecasted. And New Scale estimates it will earn 5.3% of this share, or 68 gigawatts by 2040. This translates to 883 nuclear, uh, new scale small modular reactors or 73 new scale plants, each employing 12 new scale power modules or reactors. So why don't we just solve this problem by building more big, large uh, gigawatt size reactors? The cost of capital is the big challenge uh, for these big reactors. As an example, Vogel units three and four, which are being built today in Georgia are two 1100 megawatt electric pressurized water reactors. And the final cost of these two large pressurized water reactors is currently projected to be $28.5 billion to provide 2200 megawatts of electricity delivered by June of 2023. The picture shown here is the reactor building and reactor under construction at Vogel. Uh, you can see the steam generator being lowered into place on the left of the photo. And also note how the reactor is stick built and the reactor uh, components are all stick built in this reactor building. 
So installation and construction of those components controls the pace at which the reactor building is constructed. Small modular reactors, and specifically the new scale small modular reactor, can address all of those challenges I just discussed. The new scale small modular reactor is as carbon free a power source as wind and solar, and it addresses the large reactor risks, and it can help meet the carbon reduction goals set by many countries and states. So I'm often asked, is nuclear power really carbon free? And the reply is always, is any uh, source of electricity truly carbon free? And the answer is no. All sources of electricity have some life cycle carbon footprint from the construction, fa <clears throat> construction phase or from mining or extracting the fuel as shown in this figure. Nuclear power is completely free from greenhouse gas emissions during the operation of the plant. There are no direct greenhouse gas emissions. There are some emissions from the mining as shown in the, uh, the blue bar. Nuclear is amongst the lowest greenhouse gas emitters from a full life cycle point of view. And only wind generated electricity has a lower life cycle greenhouse gas emission footprint than nuclear. Nuclear does produce other forms of waste as you're all aware. However, they're low in volume and better controlled compared to emissions from fossil fuel plants that put tons of particulates in the air daily and leave large hazardous ash piles in the case of coal. So the US nuclear fleet helps avoid hundreds of thousands of tons of harmful air pollutants every year, including the particular matter that comes with it, which causes lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, and other health impacts. So given the clean air benefits of nuclear, it's not an exaggeration to say that the US nuclear fleet saves hundreds of lives each year. Globally, it's been estimated more than 8 million people died in 2018 from fossil fuel pollution. That's according to a study by Harvard University in collaboration with several uh, English universities. So a quick tutorial on nuclear power to ensure everyone is on the same page for later discussion. So instead of coal or natural gas burning to create heat and steam in a boiler, in a nuclear reactor, uranium undergoes fission or splits to release energy, and that energy release heats the pressurized water in the reactor. That pressurized water transfers its heat to a secondary clean water loop in the steam generators. And the superheated steam from the steam generator leaves the reactor building and is piped to the turbine island where it spins a turbine, which drives the generator to produce electricity. So the turbine island and the balance of site on the right-hand side of this slide for a new scale small modular reactor is very similar to the equipment you would find on a conventional gas or coal fire plant. The new scale small modular reactor, however, fundamentally changes what's found in the reactor building on the left side of this compared to previous generation of reactors. I'll show you that change in some later slides. One of the major differences uh, in a nuclear plant is the power density contained in the heat source on the left. And just to remind you of that power density, one uranium fuel pellet about the size of a small marble will generate the same power as three barrels of oil or one ton of coal, or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. And when removed from the reactor, only 5% of the power in the fuel's uranium will have been used. The used fuel, if reprocessed later, would still contain 95% of its initial power value. We'll talk more about the fuel on some later slides. So let's look at the new scale technology. I'll start with who is New Scale and how did they come about designing and testing this small modular reactor? It began as a Department of Energy project with Oregon State University in 2000. And at the time it was envisioned to create what was called a new multi-application small light water reactor that had greatly enhanced safety and could bring a reactor market much quicker 
and be used for diverse applications. The key goals of the project at the time were to minimize the development and deployment time, maximize the use of off the shelf hardware, uh, for example, turbines, you know, optimize the operations and design it for a 60 year module life, maximize the availability factor of the plant, use offsite assembly for the reactor modules and minimize capital and operational cost. The research project ended in 2007. However, Oregon State University decided to get the rights to the project. The New Scale founders licensed those rights from OSU and created a small business called New Scale Power. New Scale was strapped for funding in the 2007 to 2011 timeframe until they were discovered by Floor. And Floor saw the potential in this technology to create a, a new, more innovative reactor that was safer, more versatile, more economical to deliver with improved scheduled certainty. Moore saw a reactor that could help reduce greenhouse gases and stem climate change. So Floor bought a major share of New Scale in 2011 and today remains the major owner of New Scale. In 2013, Floor and New Scale competed for a funding opportunity sponsored by the Department of Energy. And they won one of two awards from the Department of Energy to advance the next generation of light water small modular reactors. The award at the time was $250 million and was later increased to $450 million to help fund the development of the new scale design. Between the work that the Department of Energy and Oregon State did and the new scale work uh, that's been supported by FLOOR over the past uh, eight or nine years, over 620 patents have been granted in nearly 20 countries. And new scale now has over 430 employees in five offices in the US and one office in the United Kingdom. In 2016, the design for the 50 megawatt version of the new scale SMR was submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And in August of 2020, that design was approved. So it is today the only SMR that has been submitted to the US Regulatory, Nuclear Regulatory Commission for design review and the only SMR that's been approved by the NRC. Given the NRC approval process took nearly four years, Floor believes this puts new scale approximately four years ahead of the competition for commercial SMR deployment in Western nations. The total investment to date in new scale by DOE, Floor, and the other investors and partners is greater than 1.3 billion. So now let's talk about how this differs from other technology. The previous technology was the large pressurized water reactor or boiling water reactor. And I'll compare it today to the pressurized water reactor since new scale is a pressurized water reactor. If you look at a typical large pressurized water reactor in the USA, you'd see this large containment dome. The domes are massive, and inside the concrete dome, there are separate vessels for the reactor. There'll be multiple steam generators, there'll be a pressurizer, and those vessels will be connected by large diameter piping, typically 30 inches in diameter, and huge reactor coolant pumps that circulate the reactor coolant. Typically, there's two, three, or even four loops of reactor coolant pump and steam generator off a single reactor. That results in lots of vessels, piping, pumps, and related infrastructure that is largely stick built in the field, as we discussed on that previous slide. The new scale small modular reactor puts all of those same components in a single new scale power module or NPM. The new scale power module is an integral vessel that contains the reactor, steam gener two steam generators, the pressurizer, and those are all inside a containment vessel. The integral uh, new scale power module is about 15 feet in diameter and about 75 feet tall. There are no pumps. For comparison, the largest diameter uh, pipe in the new scale SMR is only two inches in diameter compared to that 30 inch that I just discussed. And the absence of this large bore piping in the new scale small modular reactor is one of the 
uh, key features that make it so safe because the, the large bore loss of coolant accident is one of the most challenging postulated accidents that must be addressed in large nuclear plants. The new scale small modular reactor is all factory built, not stick built in the field. So how does it operate? Reactor coolant at the bottom uh, where the reactor is goes through the core where uranium fuel fissions and heats the primary coolant. That primary coolant flows up through a riser above the core and it rises due to reduced density, flows out into the two steam generators located on either side of the riser where it transfers its heat to the secondary water loop that's inside the steam generator tubes. And then superheated secondary loop steam leaves the power module and the reactor building, goes to the turbine generators and drives the generator as we discussed uh, earlier. Pressurizer is located above the riser inside the reactor vessel and inside containment. All of those components, as I mentioned, are surrounded by a, a reactor pressure vessel that's rated at 2000 pounds per square inch. And the reactor vessel is further located inside a containment vessel rated at 1,000 pounds per square inch. For comparison, that's about 10 times stronger than that concrete containment dome for the typical large pressurized water reactor we saw in a previous slide. Hence, the, the new scale SMR containment is much more robust than the current fleet in the US. For the new scale small modular reactor, the reactor building will be mechanically complete when the new scale power modules are installed. Thus, the reactor building completion is independent of reactor fabrication, reactor delivery, and reactor installation. And that's a key factor in the construction duration, as we'll talk about later. The initial design by New Scale was for a 50 megawatt uh, New Scale power module, as I mentioned. But after thorough modeling and testing in a one third scale test facility, it's now being upgraded to 77 megawatts electric. At 77 megawatts electric, it's still the same dimension, still modular, still transportable as a unit. And a standard design approval application is currently being prepared for that 77 megawatt version and will be completed and submitted to the US NRC uh, later this year. The new scale plant size is totally scalable. You can build one reactor building and then plug in the 77 megawatt electric modules as needed to support your load. Currently up to 12 modules are envisioned for a 924 megawatt electric plant, which we have now coined the Voyager 12 plant. New scale and floor are also developing smaller versions for various clients, specifically a Voyager 6 and a Voyager 4 version. So this next picture will help you compare the new scale small modular reactor to the typical large pressurized water reactor. Note that the power module itself is about the size of one of the typical pressurized water reactor steam generators. In this typical pressurized water reactor plant, you can see the reactor, the steam generators, the reactor coolant pumps, and the pressurizer. If we compare the reactor buildings themselves, the new scale small modular reactor building is rectangular and thus cheaper to build than that dome structure of the large pressurized water reactor. The new scale reactor building is also largely underground. The base of the reactor building is about 85 feet below grade. And this helps protect against aircraft impact accident scenarios. It also helps prevent loss of the ultimate heat sink which I'll talk about in a minute. Very different from the large pressurized water reactor, the new scale small modular reactors are submerged in a pool of water, which is shown in blue on the left. And that pool of water is the ultimate heat sink and is a significant factor in the safety of the new scale design. As you can see, there are five new scale modules loaded on the left side of this cutaway. And now you see the sixth module uh, installed in that last empty bay on the left, and an arrow comparing it in size 
to the steam generators. Each of those new scale modules sit in their own bay of, and pool of water, and they feed their own dedicated powertrain. So if you have a 12 reactor plant, you will have 12 steam turbine generators. The advantage of this is that each turbine is smaller and can be purchased as a commercial off the shelf component, thus lower cost. And all the safety systems are in the reactor building in the new scale plant. In a typical PWR, you'll find a, a large number of nuclear safety related components in the turbine island and perhaps even the balance of plant. So the new scale turbine island and balance of plant are largely off the shelf, non safety related equipment. So they can be built to commercial standards. This minimizes or eliminates the nuclear premium that comes with uh, buying nuclear components and thus lowers the life cycle or levelized cost of electricity. So this is a blow up that cutaway of the reactor building. You can see the reactor pool, which contains about 5.9 million gallons of water for the 12 module plant. Five of the 12 reactors are shown in this cutaway. The sixth reactor is disassembled. The lower containment vessel is unbolted and sitting in the containment vessel flange tool on the bottom of the reactor pool. This will then allows unbolting of the reactor vessel, which you can see is sitting in the reactor vessel flange tool. And then the new scale power module is moved to this position by the overhead crane and disassembled. And then new fuel can be lowered into the uh, reactor pool and placed in the reactor vessel, all done underwater via the refueling machine. And the used fuel is then put in the storage racks in the fuel pool on the left side. During refueling, the upper module is moved to the inspection area for routine steam generator in-service inspection. And you can just see the upper part of the module laying horizontal uh, up to the left of where it says refueling machine. Refueling occurs every 18 months for the 77 megawatt plant, where each 18 months, one third of the fuel is replaced. The refueling only takes 10 days, and that's controlled by the steam generator in service inspection, not the change out of the fuel. Typically in a, a large pressurized water reactor, the refueling period would be about 30 days for a large reactor. So there's less downtime for a new scale small modular reactor and an increased capacity factor as a result. As I previously mentioned, the power modules can be installed in the reactor building after construction of the building is complete. And this keeps fabrication and installation off the critical path of construction. And the power modules can be installed by the operating crew of the plant. They don't need to be installed by the construction contractor. Uh, moving the power modules around is done the same way as they'll be moved around during refueling once you're inside the reactor building. Steam, feed water, and other minor connections are made above the water line on the top of the power module underneath that biological shield that's shown there. The biological shield is used to protect the workers who can work inside the reactor building even when all the reactors are at full power. Here's an overhead view of the reactor building. You can see the import trolley in the upper left, which brings the modules into the reactor building. It upends them and lowers them into the pool where the reactor building crane uh, then moves them to the various positions, either to the bays or the, the flange tools. The refueling machine uh, does all of the fuel handling. All the fuel offloading and unloading is done, as I said, at the bottom of the reactor pool. And the fuel pool is separated from the rest of the reactor pool. And the fuel pool can hold up to 10 years of used fuel. Once the fuel is cooled for several years, the used fuel is then loaded into dry storage casks and dry stored on a used fuel storage pad within the plant security perimeter, which I'll show you here in a minute. So here's the plot plan for the entire Voyager 12 plant. The reactor building, Radway's building, and control building, now highlighted in the middle, 
are the three nuclear buildings. The two turbine buildings are located on either side of the reactor building with six turbines in each of those buildings. The annex building uh, supports worker welfare, maintenance shops and offices. The central utilities building contains ancillary heating, cooling, electrical systems. On the lower left is the dry cast storage pad that I just mentioned, and it can store up to 60 years of used fuel. So that's the design life of the plant. The cooling towers are located outside of the security fence. So what's pictured here is the water cooled version of the new scale uh, small modular reactor. There's also an air cooled version of the plant that can be used for arid climates or sites where water is scarce. The switch yard is on the far right. The admin offices and warehouse facilities are outside the fence and on the left of this photo. And the protected area is roughly 34 acres or 14 hectares when the switch yard and cooling towers can be located outside the fence line. Altogether with parking, admin areas, switch yards, the Voyager 12 water cool plant sits on about 150 acres or 62 hectares. I mentioned the flexibility and scalability of the new scale plant. Here are several versions, as I discussed, that we're looking at with various clients. The standard plant is the Voyager 6 in the upper left. But we're also talking with clients on the uh, four module and 12 module versions. Note the multi-bay reactor building uh, can be constructed and started with any number of modules installed. Thus, you can start generating revenue uh, immediately upon installing and starting the first module, while later modules can be installed later and started as needed. As I mentioned, workers can be in the reactor building while all 12 are at power. So refueling and installation of modules and removal of modules can occur at power. The new approach to construction starts with the factory fabrication done in parallel with site preparation and plant construction. This gives you economy of production, controlled fabrication conditions, gives you a stable and skilled uh, power module workforce uh, who's producing these on mass, improved cleanliness, quality, and repeatability. So then the modular uh, power modules are shipped to the site either by barge or rail or road, depending on the site, as shown in that third graphic. Road shipment would require that the power module be shipped in three sub-assemblies. So you would disassemble the lower containment vessel head, the reactor vessel, and the upper containment vessel, and they can be easily reassembled at the site. Modular reactor delivery, uh, as I previously mentioned, eliminates the stick-built reactor and all that associated field time that comes with stick building it. That reduces the construction duration and all the associated construction indirects, construction equipment, financing costs, and cost overruns due to any disruption of building the reactor or the containment. And this is where a large portion of the savings are achieved in the small modular reactor deployment. The new approach to operation uh, is the modular addition operation and refueling of individual power modules. Refueling or an operational problem uh, only impacts a fraction, you know, one module of your generating capacity. So the other 11 twelfths would continue to operate while you refueled or solved the problem with a single unit. It also eliminates the problem with single uh, generating shaft. In a large pressurized water reactor, you lose a turbine, you lose everything. Uh, here, if you lose one turbine, you lose a fraction of your generation. So why is this reactor so safe? The safety is in the simplicity of the design. As I said previously, there are no pumps. It works entirely via natural circulation. The new scale small modular reactor is classified as passively safe since it relies just on the laws of physics and heat transfer, specifically gravity, buoyancy, convection, and conduction. So there's fewer moving parts, fewer systems to fail. 
It's robust because the reactor building is seismically robust and will withstand 0.5 Gs of peak ground acceleration. The reactors are below grade, submerged in the ultimate heat sink. Cooling water to power ratio of the new scale SMR is about four times higher than a typical pressurized water reactor. It means you have more cooling capability on hand for immediate deployment. The new scale small modular reactor has a smaller core, so there are few fission products in the fuel and thus less decay heat to remove. And as I mentioned, there's almost no possibility of a loss of coolant accident due to a large bore or a pipe break, since there are no large bore pipes in the new scale SMR. This next slide emphasizes the triple crown of safety achieved by new scale. But what is the triple crown? It means that to safely shut down and cool the new scale reactor, you need one, no operator or computer action, two, no AC or DC power, so no pumps, batteries, backup emergency generators, and three, you need no additional water. The water in the reactor pool is sufficient for the cool down into perpetuity. So the reactor is known as what's called walkaway safe. And this is a, a first for the commercial nuclear power industry. Note in the diagram that the typical decay heat versus time curve from fission products is shown at the bottom of the graph. So when a, a reactor is shut down, heat from fission of the uranium stops immediately. But the natural decay of short-lived fission products that have been building up in the fuel keeps generating heat. And this is the challenge in uh, nuclear reactors, how to remove this decay heat that arises even after the reactor is shut down. And the new scale SMR is uniquely capable of handling this decay heat with no operator action. And it's done via these decay heat removal condensers that remove the decay heat for the first few days via convection uh, and conduction. Once the pool water is uh, evaporated and lowered to the level of those decay heat removal condensers and they're uncovered, the volume between the reactor vessel and the containment vessel is then flooded with water. So now the reactor heat is directly transferred through the reactor vessel to the containment vessel and into the pool water. And that removes decay heat for the next 30 days via conduction and condensation of evaporated water uh, in the reactor building. So I, I mentioned flooding the volume between the reactor vessel and containment vessel. Normally, that is evacuated, it's under vacuum, so that there is very little heat transfer when the reactor is operating from the reactor to the pool. Evacuating that uh, volume also removes oxygen from the containment, and thus it minimizes the possibility of a hydrogen deflagration. Finally, when the water level is below the level of the fuel, you're now cooling via air cooling. And that is sufficient air cooling to remove the decay heat, which is now down to a low level uh, after 30 days. Note that while the, the reactor is known as walk away safe, uh, that's not the normal practice. Operator intervention and restorations of systems is the norm for cooling. So we would not normally use this progression. This is the emergency progression of decay heat removal. The passive safety of the new scale reactor eliminates 14 of the 22 backup safety systems found at a typical pressurized water reactor. New scale only needs the eight safety systems shown in the darker text in the upper left. So that fewer systems, as I mentioned, fewer moving parts, less design, less fabrication, less construction, commissioning, operator, operations, fewer things to fail, less maintenance. It also means at end of life, you have less decommissioning to do and less waste generated from all those systems. Elimination of these systems and their associated cost is a significant factor in the lower levelized cost of electricity in the new scale SMR design. So how safe is the, the new scale small modular reactor? It's about 10,000 times safer than the reactors operating in the USA today. 
This slide shows you that today, in terms of the frequency of failures that are postulated in the accident analysis, the reactors operating in the USA today on the left have a postulated accident frequency of one event every 10,000 to 1 million years. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's goal for new passive reactors is about one event every 10 million years. And the new scale SMR will deliver an accident uh, frequency of about three every billion module years. So hence, the new scale SMR is an improvement over today's reactor by a factor of about 10,000 times, and even exceeds the NRC's goal by a factor of nearly 1,000. The new scale SMR should not even be compared to reactors like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, or Fukushima, since it's so far advanced in terms of safety. And this isn't just theoretical. The thermal hydraulic transients and accident scenarios that could occur to a new scale SMR have been tested and proven at the one third scale test facility at Oregon State University. This slide also shows on the right uh, that there's four additional barriers to contamination release in the new scale design. First, the reactor below grade and submerged in the cooling pool with no motive force needed to get the ultimate heat sink to the reactor. Second, it's underground with a stainless steel lined fuel pool. Third, the biological shield above the reactors. And fourth, the seismic category one reactor building with heating, ventilation, and cooling over the top of the reactors and their containments. So these are new barriers to release that don't exist in other plants. And as I mentioned, the containment vessel of the new scale plant is about 10 times stronger than the containment of a conventional plant. So the new scale small modular reactor can be deployed for both on-grid and off-grid applications. Interest in the, the process heat application and hydrogen generation, I would say is as strong today as interest in the SMR for electricity generation. New scale has developed a number of white papers for each of the applications depicted on this slide, and they're available publicly on the new scale website. And the link for that website is shown in the lower right of this slide. Let's discuss a, a few of these diverse applications. Uh, first, the support of renewables. The new scale is not trying to compete with renewables. New scale is designed to complement renewables with dispatchable power uh, that has a load following capability. And I'll talk about load following in a later slide. Second, the reactor is being developed and evaluated uh, for use by clients as a source of power for mission critical facilities that need high reliability, like 99.99% reliability. This can be achieved if you're using a, a 12 module plant where you only need the power from one to always be online. So as a single unit, each has a factor, a capacity factor of about 95%. When joined together, 12 of them give you that 99.999. Third, for hydrogen generation, uh, New Scale has collaborated with Idaho National Lab and done studies on the generation capability. And the bottom line from this work is that the new scale small modular reactor producing steam at 350 centigrade can use about 2% of reactor power, superheat that steam to 850 centigrade, supply that steam from one SMR to a high temperature steam electrolysis unit and produce 50 tons of hydrogen per day. And that's for the 77 megawatt module. Fourth, a Voyager 4 plant at 308 megawatts gross could power and provide both the drinking water and electricity for a community of about 300,000 people. So that, for example, is the size of Corpus Christi, Texas. You could use one four module plant for all the drinking water and electricity. I mentioned the resilience of this reactor. The re resilience is driven by several different features. I'll start first with some of the features in new scale that aren't found in other plants. 
One is uh, black start or in the island mode. Uh, typically, when a nuclear power station loses the offsite grid, there's no outlet for the power, and the reactors are tripped and go offline and shut down. But for new scale, the plant is built with 100% steam bypass at each of those turbines. So you can immediately dump 100% of the steam to the condenser and keep the reactor at 100% power. Then the operator of this plant's ready to restore steam to the turbine and restore power to the grid the moment the grid is restored. So keeping one reactor online, at least, supplying the internal loads of the plant is called island mode. Black start is allowed by a diesel, a single or two diesel generators inside the plant can start up at least one reactor if all are shut down. So these features allow the new scale plant to be a first responder with power to the grid when the grid is restored. Third, the new scale small modular reactor is more resilient to natural events. With the reactor located below grade in a seismic category one rated building submerged in the ultimate heat sink, it's protected against uh, lots of natural disasters. And like all other nuclear plants, it's designed to withstand high winds from tornadoes and hurricanes up to 190 miles per hour and large earthquake uh, motion rated at uh, 0.5 Gs of peak ground acceleration for the new scale SMR. So it's very resilient to natural events. And as we've seen time and time again in the USA, the nuclear power plants are the ones that survive large natural disasters, and the new scale plant will survive as well or better than these previous reactors. As with all nuclear power plants in the US, it's designed to be resilient to aircraft impact. As I said, we take advantage of it being below grade to make it even more so for new scale. And for cybersecurity, the new scale plant runs on what are called field programmable gate arrays. So there's no software in the control system. Therefore, it's not vulnerable to software attack. And the logic for operating the plant protection systems is hard coded onto these field programmable gate array cards. So it must be physically inside the plant to modify or change out that system. Additionally, the new scale small modular reactor is hardened against electromagnetic pulse and geomagnetic disturbances beyond that uh, of the current fleet. I mentioned load following earlier. Load following capability has become increasingly important for all power plants and nuclear power plants, especially operating in concert with renewable power sources. An important feature of the, the new scale SMR is the added flexibility that it provides to load follow and support wind and solar. And namely, the, the new scale small module director has three load following modes. First, for longer term load following, you have module dispatch where individual modules can be shut down or started up. And you can see how quickly that can be done on this slide. For the medium term disruptions, let's say for an hour to a week, you can uh, up or down power the individual modules, and that's the reactor power change line item. And then for very short term transients, like the grid trips momentarily, uh, you can go to that turbine bypass that I already described. In the medium term scenario, the, pod, the new scale module maneuvers much quicker than large pressurized water reactors. You can change 80% power in 96 minutes, so it's a rather uh, rapid uh, up power maneuver. And it's even faster down power. Now cycling a nuclear reactor to allow load following is not the ideal way to operate a nuclear plant. You'd like to operate it constant 100% power. That is the most cost effective and economical. So some clients are evaluating hydrogen production using the reactor in lieu of power generation when there's excess power on the grid from renewables. Thus, the generation of hydrogen becomes a, a form of energy storage and a potential source of producing uh, transportation fuels or just re reversing those uh, 
hydrolysis cells and producing power. The question always comes up, what about the waste? The highly radioactive waste that you read about is really used fuel. When the fuel is taken out of the reactor, as I mentioned, there's still 95% of the unused energy in the fuel. Someday, I believe the USA will remove this fuel from storage and reprocess the fuel to recover the unused uranium. But today, that is not cost effective or economical. In the USA, when the USA returns to fuel reprocessing, the new scale SMR can be fueled via recovered uranium or mixed oxide fuel, which it's fuel made from excess uranium and plutonium stocks. Uh, the new scale SMR can also be powered using thorium. However, the initial plan is to use fresh, low enriched, that means less than 5%, standard uh, pressurized water reactor fuel. The only difference from today's pressurized water reactor fuel is the height of the fuel element. The fuel element uh, shown in this figure is about six feet tall. The new scale fuel is thus uh, well proven, well tested uh, over many, many years of operation in the pressurized water reactors around the world. As I mentioned, the fuel is safely managed by keeping it cooled and wet in the fuel pool. And then for up to 60 years on the dry storage pad, which was shown in the previous slide, all of the storage needed for both wet and dry storage for the 60 year life of this plant is already included in the design and the cost estimate. For the low level waste that's generated by a plant, I would say it's well managed. It has numerous outlets. It's fully accounted for and the levelized cost of electricity uh, that are made, the calculations made for the new scale plant. Similarly, all the fuel costs and fuel storage and disposition costs are built into the the levelized cost of electricity calculations for new scale and in the plant decommissioning costs that are also built into the levelized cost of electricity. Once the fuel heat has decayed down to low levels, it's moved into these passively safe dry storage casks. These are very robust containers that are licensed and approved by the USNRC. These casks are stored on an open air concrete pad in the fence line of the facility. And the pad will hold fuel generated over the 60 year life of the facility. The life cycle cost of fuel handling for nuclear plants is uh, funded via a fund built up over the life of the plant using a small tariff on the cost of power sold. And all that funding goes into what's called the nuclear waste fund in the US. And that fund is controlled by the US Department of Energy. So today from nuclear operators in the US, there's about $45 billion in the nuclear waste fund uh, ready to handle that waste over its life cycle. To my knowledge, nuclear generation utilities are the only utilities that pre-finance all the handling of their used fuel and decommissioning costs. So what's the deployment status of this reactor? The design certification, as we said, is uh, underway, completed for the uh, 50 megawatt version and underway for the 77 megawatts. And as I mentioned, New Scale is about four years ahead of our competitors in this. Uh, who, those competitors have not yet submitted their designs for review to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The New Scale application was quite extensive with over 12,000 pages submitted including 14 topical reports, required greater than 2 million labor hours, cost over $500 million to get that standard design done and approved by the NRC for the 50 megawatt plant. We announced in uh, August of 2020 that the US NRC had completed their phase six, the final phase of review of the design certification application and issued the final safety evaluation report. That final safety evaluation represents completion of a technical review and approval of the design and its safety case. So customers can now proceed with plans to develop plant power plants based on that NRC approval. This further cements New Scale's position as the leading SMR in the marketplace and the only design ready to bring the benefits of carbon-free energy to the marketplace in the near term. 
As I mentioned, the design approval was for 50 megawatts, and in late 2022, NewScale will submit the design approval application for the 77 megawatt uprated version. And we expect the NRC review and approval of the uprated version should be much quicker than it was for the 50 megawatt, since many of the aspects uh, are unchanged or minimally changed. Now we're testing actual components. So this isn't just a paper reactor. We have fabricated many of the components at some of the vendors we've already selected. We fabricated the helical coil steam generator tubes and are testing them at the fab facility. We've already developed the fuel assemblies, as we said, they're proven and tried and tested. In Corvallis, Oregon, there's a one third new scale test facility, which is allowing us to test the thermal, thermal hydraulic response under normal and accident conditions to confirm our safety case and our safety analysis codes. And New Scale's also built a full scale operational control room and simulator. The, the one pictured here uh, is, is not an artist's rendition, that's an actual uh, control room in Corvallis, Oregon, that has been used. Uh, in demonstrations with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to approve innovative staff planning approaches. The unique human factors that are built into this control room are going to allow a significant reduction in plant staffing levels while still preserving the exemplary safety performance of this plant. And so this helps reduce the levelized cost of electricity without compromising safety. The first client has now committed contractually. Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems represents 50 members in the West. And of those 50 members, 27 of them have signed up to be part of what's called the Carbon Free Power Project and to accept power from this project. They've signed power purchase agreements and additional potential participants are lining up to take additional power from the project. While UAMPS is headquartered in Salt Lake City, the plant is going to be built on the Idaho National Laboratory site in southeastern Idaho. UAMPS has selected the project site where they will build a Voyager 6 462 megawatt plant. That is the standard plan, as I mentioned. In January 2021, UAMPS and FLOR signed the EPC development agreement, which engaged FLOR in design engineering, procurement, and construction activities leading up to the ultimate aim of awarding the actual EPC construction contract. Also in 2021, site geotechnical characterization went into full swing on the site. We've now completed over 50 boreholes and 10 water test wells and done extensive seismic and volcanic hazard assessment analyses that are now underway. Site-specific design was also initiated in 2021, and that was done in, to support the uh, combined operating license application that was also kicked off in 2021 uh, to begin developing the application submitted to the NRC for approval to build and operate this plant. UAMPS has selected an air-cooled version of the new scale uh, Voyager 6 unit because of the precious water resources and arid site in Idaho. Site preparation and excavation will start in 2025 and pouring of the first safety related concrete for the reactor building will be in 2026 with commercial power operations beginning in 2029. Subject to your questions, that completes my overview of this innovative floor owned new scale small modular reactor technology. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Pete. Great presentation today. We have a ton of questions that have come in, so let's start navigating um, through some of those. So the first one is, when do we expect to achieve the next NRC approval for the 77 megawatt module? So I can't predict uh, exactly NRC schedules. Obviously, they operate to their own rigorous review schedule. However, as I mentioned, the first one was four years and not a lot uh, has changed. Many of the analyses and justifications they will see in the 77 megawatt plant will be similar to the 50 megawatt plant. So we expect it to be quite uh, quick. 
It will be done in parallel with them approving the combined operating license application. And that we expect it will be a 30 month review and approval. And we expect the standard design approval to be less than that 30 months. So we expect the standard design approval to happen before the combined operating license. So less than 30 months. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, next question. Uh, what is the longevity of a facility? There's a couple parts to this question. So let's start with that, that piece. What's the longevity of a facility? So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will only issue a license for 40 years. So you'll sometimes see a 40 year plant life number. That's a licensing life. The design life of the facility is 60 years. Uh, many of the plants in the USA today were designed for 40 year life and have then through life extension efforts been extended to 60 and even 80 years. Yes, so, so, so do you mean that then individual reactors could be replaced to extend plant longevity or would this not be necessary based on the design? As a start, you would try to increase the longevity of that existing module past 60 to 80. If that couldn't be done, the modular nature of it makes it much easier for, for you to do a replacement. But today we are extending the reactors themselves at US nuclear plants for an additional 20 or 40 years. So there is a precedent for reactors to be extended beyond their 40 year life to up to 80 years. And I'm sure operators who buy the new scale plant will be looking to do the same. Right. Wow, that's a long time. <laughs> um, all right, next question here. What is the current levelized cost of energy per kilowatt of new scale? So the levelized cost of electricity question is a very difficult one to ask, and uh, I won't be pinned down today uh, on what that number is for new scale. Some of the, the numbers that I might offer to throw out would be protected by non-disclosure agreements with clients. Other numbers I would throw out have a ton of bases underneath those numbers. For example, you have to understand what cooling type you're talking about, what is the tax structure of where you're going to deploy it, any tax credits that you might uh, take advantage of, how is it financed has a huge factor on what the levelized cost of electricity is. You know, whether it's a independently operated utility or a municipality, greatly impacts the financing cost and thus the LCOE. And one thing I've learned is as soon as you provide a, a cost number, it's easily misrepresented out there. So I, I won't put out a number. I would say we are achieving and, and committing to numbers that will make it competitive with renewables, with battery storage, or with combined cycle gas with carbon capture. That's the goal is to be competitive with those other producers. Right, that makes complete sense. Thanks, Pete. Um, so next question for you, has a building specification for the reactor building been developed? I'm not knowledgeable enough on that one to answer it online. So standard plant design is well along for the building. Uh, and there will be a, a technical specification document, I'm almost certain uh, that's been developed that those standard plant designers will be using and then there could be site-specific design modifications to it for the Idaho site. Uh, so I'm thinking the answer is yes, but I'll defer to answering that one later. Okay, maybe that's something we can provide in a follow-up. Uh, next question is, um, has the passive safety been tested in prototypes or is it still theoretical? So the passive safety has been tested in prototypes. As I mentioned, there's the one third scale thermal hydraulic test facility in Corvallis. So obviously we're not using nuclear fuel. That's an electrical powered simulated reactor, uh, but you can simulate all of the uh, flows and heat transfer characteristics and verify the codes we are using. So to the extent that, that any uh, reactor or heat transfer uh, device is proven before it's built. Yes, it's proven. Great. Thank you. Next question. How is the quality of the cooling water for reactors maintained? 
So remember, there's two loops of water. There's the primary loop inside the reactor, which never goes outside the reactor uh, vessel. And then there's the secondary water that goes through the steam generator. So the, the reactor water, uh, there is a uh, chemical addition and makeup system that penetrates the top end of the reactor where you can add and change the chemistry of the reactor coolant. So uh, that is the one of those two inch diameter pipes that I mentioned. For the steam generator, um, we keep very tight chemistry control on the secondary water because uh, good chemistry control on the steam generators helps steam generator life. And that is one of the leading causes of uh, extensive maintenance or repair at nuclear power plants. So um, also using high quality tubing and the condensers to prevent iron being released into that secondary water and then downstream of the condensers, we have condensate polishing, which cleans up the secondary water prior to returning it to the steam generator. So there's extensive equipment for both primary and secondary water to keep very tight cleanliness controls. Great. Now, during your presentation, you mentioned that um, 0.5 G seismic force was, was uh, included. Is that is it intended that the support system be custom designed for any range of seismic design loads in the U.S.? That number was chosen to uh, hopefully be robust enough that we could build this reactor anywhere in the U.S. That was the basis of the, the 0.5 G design criteria for the standard plant. Now that gets evaluated during the combined operating license application. We will be looking at whether uh, you know, 0.5 G's is acceptable for the Idaho site. And even more specifically, we'll be looking at the, you know, the various different frequencies, not the just the peak acceleration, but uh, the various seismic frequency response to make sure that the design encompasses the most the probabilistic risk assessment we do on seismic for the site you're going to build on. I hope I think that answered the question. Yeah, so I, I think you're saying that the second part of the question, um, I think you're saying there is a design cycle that would occur if there were lateral loads in excess of this value, correct? Correct. Right, correct. okay. And then you would then determine if the reactor would be appropriate to be installed in that geographical location. Correct. That's right. part of the site-specific design effort and the licensing application. Great. Okay, thanks. Um, what is the strategy for the delivery of multiple facilities due to the high numbers forecasted to be operational by 2040? So initially, uh, we have sourced two different fabrication fabricators for the new scale power modules uh, in order to handle what we forecast as the initial load. And as uh, additional clients uh, come forward, we can expand uh, at those two fabricators that we've pre-selected, or we can uh, select third, fourth, other fabricators. Uh, th this is uh, fabricate to uh, drawing, you know, fabricate to design. So there are a number of places this could be fabricated. Obviously it's quite uh, tight tolerances, high quality, nuclear QA. So there isn't an unlimited number of places in the U.S. that can build it, but it is a much thinner reactor vessel than the large pressurized water reactors I talked about, whose reactor vessel walls are large forgings that might be 12 to 18 inches thick. You know, the new scale reactor vessel is on the order of several inches thick. Um, so it can be fabricated in a, a less robust facility than the, the large PWR. So that opens up the aperture a little for where you can fabricate these. And we hope we have the problem of needing additional fabricators. <laughs> yeah, that's always a great problem to have. Um, now, would there be additional overseas fabricators? Um, potentially, yes. There's nothing that limits this to uh, fabrication in the U.S. As a matter of fact, one of the two fabricators is overseas. And the second fabricator is partly headquartered in the U.S. and part of the fabrication is outside the U.S. So 
we've already chosen fabrication outside the U.S. Okay, great. It seems like we're getting a lot of questions of whether, you know, these facilities will be built outside of the USA. Could you comment on that? If, if you say these facilities, if that means new scale plants. Yes, absolutely. If you mean if modules will be built outside the USA. Yes, absolutely. The both. Okay, great. All right. Well, it looks like we are um, almost out of our time here at the end um, of the presentation. And so I want to thank everyone for your time, for all of the questions and those that we didn't get to, we will be reviewing. You can continue to stay informed of our Innovation Builders events um, by visiting the Innovation Builders page on floor.com or following our social media channels using the hashtag Innovation Builders. And if you'd like to send if you'd like us to send you email notifications of future webinars, you can email us at innovation.builders at floor.com with opt-in in the subject line. We really appreciate your attention today and thank you for dialing in. Uh, the recording will be available within a few days and will be emailed to those who registered and we'll also put it up on YouTube and floor.com. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will certainly get back to you. So from all of us on the Innovation Builders team, please have a safe day and thank you for attending.